You're listening to the Theology Podcast with Ben Knight and Rob Royce. Hello and uh, welcome to Theologics Podcast. My name is Ben Knight. I am Rob Royce. And uh, what, Rob? Why are we doing this? What What is this? Uh, well, you and I used to podcast quite a bit, and uh, we had a podcast called the Left of Center Podcast, and uh, I felt like it was it was gaining some popularity, and we were gaining momentum as a duo, and and just life happened, and we haven't, true. and we stopped. And it's, it's time. It's time to start it up again. It is. It is time to start it up again. But, but the thing about the Left to Center podcast, the thing was based out of the Bible where it says that, that God has set a plumb line in Israel. And uh, and we find ourselves... Here, I'm pouring my coffee. Is Rob it. is not peeing right now. That, that is <laughs> coffee going to the cup. Yeah. No, uh, uh, here God has set a plumb line. He, he and his word is the plumb line straight up and down. And we find ourselves in our sinful nature off center. And, uh, and that was the idea, but a lot of people ended up thinking yeah. that we were just a left wing. Yep. Cause left of center. Yeah. Um, I guess we could have called it right of center and that might've helped. I don't know. I don't know. Then they would, they would have thought we were a conservative podcast and they, everybody thought we were a liberal, liberal podcast. So people kind of wrote us off right, right off the bat. So now we're a liberal conservative podcast. <laughs> we're just a we're, podcast. We're just a podcast. We're a theology podcast. We're a theology podcast. So Basically, every week we're going to break down a subject um, that Mr. Royce here, who is who is a pastor and a youth pastor, uh, so he's he's coming at this from two angles of the sure. same side of the coin. Um, I am neither of those things. I am just I am I am the voice of the audience. I am here to challenge Rob and myself at the same time. Where I am going to. Um, Basically, I'm going to speak for you, the audience. I'm going to go, hmm. Rob, what are we talking about? Yeah. And how are you right? And how are you wrong? And are you wrong? And are you right? And just, but it's going to be fun. We're going to have fun with it. That's going to be great. And I'm, I'm excited about it. By the way, we, we are now starting. Uh, we were supposed to start this morning. 7 a.m. At 7 a.m. What time is it right now? 12. It is it's 12. It's 11.59 a.m. It is 11.59 a.m. So... I woke up and actually, I'm Rob is having coffee. Yeah, um, I'm going to. You know, in, in all fairness, yeah, here you go. Okay, this is That's... early morning for me because of the because of the time I actually went to bed last night. <sighs> just in case anybody's wondering, I, I just I just uh, opened up a large Wait, can can, of Red Bull. Can we say that? Uh, they're not what? paying for that. That's they're not paying for it. I paid for it. I paid for this Red Bull. <laughs> um, no, uh, yeah, we were supposed to start at seven a.m. Uh, we Rob... should have edited that one. Rob a had can of <laughs> <laughs> Rob Rob had a Christmas thing last night, so um, got he back was, late. Yeah, he was out super late, so I, I drug my butt out of bed at six a.m. to shower, and then I got a text from him at six thirty, going, "Hey, did you get my text last night that like I got home late, so we're not going to do it early? No way." So, so I'm super tired, and I'm I'm drinking a Red Bull. Rob's having coffee, and but hey, we're just glad to be get we're, we're glad to get started here. And uh, by the way, this is a Christmas podcast. Yes, sir. It is a Christmas podcast. So, Merry Rob, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas to you. You know what? And I and I feel happy saying that we this podcast, the Theology Podcast, we we, we are not a Starbucks coffee cup, so hmm. we can say Merry Christmas. Yeah, that's that's how we roll. And happy Happy Holidays. The nice and thing about holidays. being free to say Merry Christmas is that you can say Happy Holidays as well, and you don't feel like you're saying Happy Holidays instead of Merry Christmas. Exactly. And you can say them both. Exactly. Why not just say? Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays and and a Happy New Year to you and a ha- see exactly it can all work it all works it all works we leave we leave nothing out well I did want to uh, so I mean you know, Merry Christmas to you guys who are listening right now um, since it is Christmas you know I don't know about you Rob do you do you guys watch a lot of Christmas movies uh you know what I if I say no it's mainly because as a family we don't really watch a lot of movies. Uh, but I, I'm not opposed to him, to any. You're not, you're not opposed. You're like yeah, I, like I, I know, I know, I neither condemn nor. Well, I'll see where you're going with this, and okay. then maybe I'll comment. Fair enough. Well, this is this is 
So I was trying to think of a top 10. Everybody does top 10 lists, right? Yeah. And uh, I'm no David Letterman, but uh, so what I came up with is these are the top 10 Christmas movies at my house right now. All right. Like this is, this is, these are the most popular and these are in no particular order because, uh, I don't know about your wife, but both of us are married. Yep. And my wife watches Christmas movies year round, basically year round. All right. So, um, and we actually got rid of our cable and we signed up for, for uh, well, hold on. All right. (laughs) We got rid of the cable, but we now have, uh, Hulu TV. Oh, and the reason is because it's cheaper, A, and B, because now my wife can watch anything, anything, <laughs> any Christmas movie on any channel at any time. All right. So now there's a lot of Lifetime movies going on at the house and not like, you know, not, you know, not the, you know, television for women Lifetime, but the Christmas oh, yeah. movies on Lifetime. Ooh. So, all right. Anyway, so right now in no particular order, uh, the Home Alones, one through three. Oh, yeah. All three? the Home Alones. Well, one through three. Isn't there like five? Well, actually, there's. Well, actually, you know what? I take it back. Well, there's like four or five, and not not three. Just the first two. Okay, the first two. I'm with you there. Um, and actually, since we're talking about it real quick, what is there? What is the favorite moment in any Home Alone movie for you? Do you have one? If you don't, I have one. While you can think about it. You you go ahead and say. Okay, it. mine is um, Home Alone two, and it's where it's toward the end of the movie and he get, you know he's in his uncle's or he's on top of his uncle's apartment building yeah and or house or whatever and he throws the first brick and it hits Harry or no it, hit, it hits Marv. Uh, Marv and I laugh every stinking time because it hits him and he goes Harry <laughs> And I laugh every time. I think it's hysterical. So that's that. That might be my absolute favorite home alone moment. Oh man, uh, I think uh, I love the in the first home alone movie when when Marv is going up the stairs, and there's that nail <laughs> because like, he he doesn't feel it when it first touches his foot. Which he doesn't weird. feel it when it first goes into his foot. He like goes all the way which all make, the way on it which makes you wonder because like how is that even possible <laughs> like i've never been so revved up or like had that much anything where like a nail going through my foot isn't immediately like just and yet i think we've all been there where we've stepped on a nail and we know the feeling and and how there's just kind of like the the it's a comedic timing thing really because there's like the exact amount of time it needs to be not you know just funny like cuz the foot goes down on the nail, and there it sits for a second, and then he reacts. It's yeah, it's for, like the perfect for timing. comedic timing. It works, like, but I, I like it's, it's false, Rob. It's false. <laughs> it doesn't happen that way. I've stepped on a nail or two, oh, and it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that but way. To me, that's the. I think that's the part that I like the most. You're right, because you're, that's a, your question. It's it's a good one. No, I li- I like that one. I like that one. Well, and here's so here's number two. Uh, I'm sure you've never heard of this one. It's called Becoming Santa. Never heard uh, of it. It has Meredith Baxter in it, who... Do you remember Family Ties? Uh, a uh, little Michael bit. Fa- she, was, she was the mom. Okay. Uh, basically, for anybody out there who wants to check it out, it's a woman who brings her boyfriend home for Christmas to meet her parents. Yes, this is the synopsis. Santa and Mrs. Claus. Uh, he must decide if he's willing to continue their relationship after learning that he'd be the next in line for Santa's job. Gee. It's uh, It's terrible. Uh, okay. I've sat through it several times. My wife loves it. Can't get enough of it. It's it's bad. It's very bad. Um, the Twelve Dates of Christmas. Never heard uh, of that either. Yeah, it's. Uh, Is this like a lifetime? These are lifetime. These are lifetime movies. movies. I, I don't even want to talk about this one because it bums me okay. out. It's it basically well, basically it's. Um, imagine like a really bad version of Groundhog's Day, or Groundhog Day. With Bill Murray. Which I think I've only seen parts of. That's See, that's one of my all-time favorite movies, and that's why I really don't like this one, because it's a bad Christmas version of Groundhog Day. All right. Uh, Christmas with the Cranks, Tim Allen, Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, also lame, but... Uh, but it's in there. It, it, yeah, it's in there. It's in my <laughs> one lame. Deck the Halls, uh, Matthew Broderick, Danny DeVito. I have never seen that. Uh, you, um, again, uh, you're not... Not missing anything. You're not missing anything. Okay. It's uh, you can avoid that one. Uh, Christmas reservations. Um, also, uh, also kind of a, and, and these aren't necessarily lifetime. They're like whatever you know. Like I mean, they're television movies. You know, um, this one has Melissa Joan Hart, which of course 
most people probably be like, oh, Sabrina the Teenage Witch. That's yeah. that's her. Um, yeah. Also, avoid. Bad. Not good. Okay. Uh, a gift wrapped Christmas, which my wife was watching last night. Also bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. See, I, I, it's so funny. At the time, I wanted to talk about these, but they're just so no, bad. So, I can't so do really, it. as you go down the list, did you have Home Loans one and two as as like two movies in their countdown, or as one two, movie in as your- as one movie in the count as as one? Well, kind of like you know, kind of like the well. Here, well, so here's number eight. Oh, the Santa Claus movies. Yeah, one through All, three. One through three. Okay. Um, one good. Hmm. Uh, two. All right. Three. Um, I never saw the third one. It's got Martin Short in it, which I thought the second one had Martin Short. No, in it. no, third one. Oh. And the third one, it, Martin Short. Uh, I just, it's, I just. I would. I. I wanted to say something funny about that. There's just nothing funny about it. it he's. He's awful. He's yeah. all. It's. He had his day, and it's not today. It's not today. It is not. Uh, and I'll just buzz through the last two really quick. Uh, um, Sweet Mountain Christmas. Basically, it's like a country singer who's like, I don't want to go to my hometown because I got a chip on my shoulder. And then, uh, then she gets stuck there, and then she becomes their part of their town thing. And then she. Let me guess. She there. falls in love there. Yeah, pretty much. Right. That's how all these work, yeah. Rob. You know, yeah. it's okay. And then the one that actually, the, the one TV movie that I don't mind as much, uh, it's called The Flight Before Christmas. See what they did there? Yeah, I sure did. Um, two strangers who both happen to be in marketing, hello, <laughs> share a room at a bed and breakfast when a snowstorm strands their flight in Montana on Christmas Eve. Montana, huh? Um, it's actually not bad. And what's interesting with this one, is, so it's got Mayim Bialik, who, for those of you who are super old, know her from Blossom. For those of you who are <laughs> younger... Um, she's Amy on, um, uh, Big Bang Theory. Um, it's her. I've never seen either of those shows. Can ever? That? Uh-uh. Wow. And you know what? That you, you, you're probably better off. Let's all, let's, let's all just agree. You're probably better off. Well, and, and I, I can say, I think I can, I think I know which actress you're talking about, but I don't think I've ever actually heard her name. Mayim Bialik. Mm-mm. Um, and actually the, the fun thing about this movie is it brings two people back from TGIF, hmm. back from back in the day. It's, uh, uh, let's see, crud. I don't know if I wrote it down or not. Um, uh, what is her name? Uh, it's Carl and Harriet from Family Matters. So it's got um, Reginald Bell Johnson, and I can't remember her name. I can't remember, but it's the mom and dad from Family Matters. The thing I love about Theologique's podcast so far, <laughs> and just like I did about the Left of Center podcast, it totally exposes, like, like Ben is totally up on pop culture and i am i'm a total lame i'm totally up on pop culture Man, from 20 have, years ago i have like half of, like i don't understand any of these references hardly i'm like so we're gonna talk about wham rob do you remember wham no that's not wham that was a, you you remember wham don't you the band yeah the band yeah, but I can't think of a thing that they did. I know. That was me trying to be... Yeah, <laughs> see, that wasn't funny either. Okay, so we're going to move on from that. Um, so we're going to do one more... We're going to do one more top ten here. Okay. And the top ten is... Uh, these are the... T- and I'm making it all about... This is the... Uh, episode one. I'm making it all about me uh, at the beginning here. Um, top ten Christmas songs played in my house or in the car um, this year. And uh, again, in no particular order... Um, if you don't like these songs, some of them I'm with you. I'm gonna write these down. All right, number one, "Hippopotamus for Christmas." I, I assume you are familiar with that. Mm-mm. You've never. I want a hippopotamus for Christmas. That one? No. You've never heard. My where, goodness. Where would I have heard that? Wow. People, it's like an old song from like 50 years ago or something. Like wow, people, huh. people, people might be shutting off the podcast right now. Yeah, okay, no, this Rob, this Rob doesn't have it. Good... No, was that number ten or number one? That was number one. No, okay. Uh, cool. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. Oh, yeah, of course I know. Of course, Rob. If, I was gonna say if Rob didn't know that we're, we were gonna walk out the door right now. Um, Silver bells. All right, ladies and gentlemen, through the uh, through the invention of editing, we uh, took a little pause, but we're we're right, we're right back into this thing. So unless we want to go back and talk about the the top ten list for the movies. Yeah, let's not do that. Okay, no. But, uh, okay, so number three was Silver Bells. Number three um, was Silver Bells. What was number two? Uh, you're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. Uh, Grinch. Number one, Hippopotamus for Christmas. Yeah. Uh, number four, one of my all-time favorite Christmas songs, uh, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Yeah. Love that one. Love it. Big fan. Uh, number five, Mary, Did You Know? 
That's number five. That's number five. Uh, number six, Sleigh Ride of All Songs. I got to talk about that one in a minute. Okay. Uh, number seven, uh, probably off of your radar, but I bet you've heard it, uh, Christmas and Hollis. Little run DMC Christmas music. Really? Um, yeah, I'm a fan. I like it. Hmm. It's good stuff. Um, How do you spell it? Hollis? H-O-L-L-I-S, as in the town of. Yeah. Um, number eight, uh, this has got to be this has got to be like a lot of people's favorites. Linus and Lucy. Oh yeah. Vince Gar- how do you pronounce Garaldi? No idea. Or some something like G U A R D L I something like Try that. Try to play that on piano sometime. I know your wife can do it. Can she? I, kinda. Sorta. She can it's she, like it's like the right hand and the left hand are doing totally different things. Usually a- even in jazz, the left hand and the right hand correspond to each other. Not not in Linus and Lucy. I love that song. I, I, I could listen to it all day long. Uh, number nine, um, if you can get away with just talking a song, mm-hmm. it's this one. And that'd be Christmas rapping. The old, uh, oh, how does that go? Uh, uh, gosh, see, I can't even, th- I'm trying to think of how it goes. It's like, um, it's the waitress, I think it's the waitresses. Does that sound right? See, I, it's okay, it's embarrassing. <laughs> anyway, Christmas rapping. Uh, number 10. The last, uh, the chipmunk song, Christmas Don't oh, Be yeah. Late. Christmas Don't Be Late. You know, Christmas, oh, Christmas, yeah. Okay, yeah, let's not do that. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, that's another, That's that. those are the top 10 uh, songs that are being played in my house or in my vehicle. And I got to break it to you about number six there. Sleigh Ride is not about Christmas. I mean, I mean, like you technically, could, you you are you are correct. You could make the argument that most of these songs aren't about Christmas. When if we're if we're going to get like, here's the true meaning of Christmas. True. But but sleigh ride actually doesn't have a single solitary Christmas reference in it. Do you know what it's about? Most people don't. I guess I don't know. I guess I don't know the is it the ed- ed- etymology is that the right word? Well, basically, here's what's going on in sleigh ride. Uh, two kids who are like falling in love with each other or something like teenagers today will go cruise main street you know in their pickup we live in we live in small towns here in the middle of <laughs> two kids you know cruising down and they're, they're 64 just, or whatever no they're quite literally the towns that, that ben and i live in we live in different towns about trucks. 25 miles away from each other both agricultural communities and each town has maybe one well i think my town has two main streets so you can go down the main highway through town and then there's another perpendicular uh, road that you can go down and kids literally they they have these pickups and they that's all they do they go cruise main right i'm sure in, in your town they do well there's that too. In, in my town there is one main there's street. one main street so so that's what teenagers do is they cruise main so you rewind 120 years ago and the way that teenagers would do this there is no cruise in main street in your pickup but you would go on a sleigh ride right so it's lovely weather for a sleigh ride together with you but what happens in the song that like really here's what happens in the song is their cheeks are getting rosy and they're admiring each other for their rosy cheeks it's probably getting a little chilly so they end up crashing farmer gray's birthday party so that talks about all these different festivities that we're all familiar with. We usually associate with Christmas, hearing the chestnuts pop, 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 and all that stuff. That's all at Farmer Gray's birthday party, and that's what the song's about. Wow, I, I, I don't know if I've ever listened to the song that clearly. Because well, I remember, like, I, the only thing I ever remember is, like, going for a sleigh ride with you. Giddy up, <laughs> giddy up, giddy up, let's, let's go. go. And then I that, look at the show, whatever that is. I don't yeah. know what that is. So maybe they're just they're just like look, look, look. maybe the show is just them. It's just the whole thing. It's sure. the whole sure. Yeah. Now we would like we're going to the movies or something. But 120 years ago that wouldn't have been the case. That's true. No, I, I the only reason I looked at the song that close is because I was taking a critical look at uh, and maybe maybe this is where we're going with this conversation today. I, w- I was taking a look at pop culture Christmas versus the true meaning of Christmas and how. Uh, and how we venerate a song like Sleigh Ride just as much as we would O Come O Come Emmanuel. Where one has, one is very much about the true meaning of, meaning of Christmas. The other one is about Crashing Farmer Gray's Birthday Party. We both would call, the both songs would be called quintessential Christmas songs. And and my criticism, and, and this is why I looked into it this way. The criticism I have is, is that you can't 
bring sleigh ride or here comes Santa Claus, here comes Santa Claus right down Santa Claus Lane. You can't elevate those songs to the level of the true meaning of Christmas, but by by making them quintessential Christmas songs, you can drag down you can drag down the true meaning of Christmas to that level. You know what I mean? Can be done. Yeah, and that's my criticism. And that, and so here we are into well into the theola of the theologiques. It's true. And and uh, what is what is our topic today, sir? Well, we're ch- we're going to talk about just like I've been uh, kind of uh, vamping on here. Uh, we are going to talk about whether or not Christians should celebrate Christmas. Did you hear the hush fall? <laughs> So should we? Should we as Christians celebrate Christmas? Um, and and not just of course. I mean, of course, obviously, the true meaning of Christmas, the birth of Jesus Christ. Yes, of course. But should we celebrate the trees and the eggnog and the presents and the big fat man who comes down the chimney with you know packages? Should we be opening presents? Should we be decorating our houses? Well, and, and you know, there's really you could really. Uh, you could even really make the case. I've heard the case made before that that uh, even when it comes to celebrating the birth of Christ, celebrating his birthday, uh, that might be up for debate. It's true. That is true. And actually, to start things out, so someone who's much wiser than myself, um, which Rob is also much wiser than myself. No, um, no, 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 the, the, no. Well, the, no. The, the, theologi- you, you decide. Theolo- yeah, there you go. Theologically speaking. Um, but you, you, if you're listening to this, you probably know a man named John Piper. I, mm. I, I'm pretty sure, Rob, you know, you know John Piper. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Um, so John Piper, actually, somebody had asked him about this years ago. And this was his response. So I'm just going to read through this really, really quick. And this was John Piper's response. He says, I sympathize with those who want to be rigorously and distinctly Christian, who want to be disentangled from the world and any pagan roots that might lie beneath our celebration of Christmas. But I don't go that route on this matter because I think there comes a point where the roots are so far gone that the present meaning doesn't carry the pagan connotation anymore. I'm more concerned about a new paganism that gets layered on top of Christmas holidays. So right away he's kind of telling us, all right, well, let's see where where he goes with this. I like like where he's at so far. Yep. So here's the example that he uses. All language has roots somewhere. Most of our days of the week, if not all, grew out of pagan names too. So should we stop using the word Sunday because it may have been related to the worship of the sun once upon a time? So Rob, let me ask you, should we mm-hmm. stop using the word Sunday? Of course not. Okay. So there you go. In modern English, Sunday doesn't carry that connotation, of course. And that's the very nature of language. In a sense, holidays are like chronological language. So, so far, we see where Mr. Piper's going with this. Yeah, totally. Um, so Christmas now means that we mark in Christian ways the birth of Jesus Christ. So, yeah, of course. Um, I think the birth, death, and resurrection of Christ are the most important events in human history. Not to mark them in some way by way of special celebration would be folly, it seems to me. So, he's correct. So, Mm -hmm. for us Christians, that is the most... I mean, you know, the birth of Christ is pretty monumental, so why not take a day... You know. Right. Well, well, and 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 nobody like like you think. Okay, pagan roots. We're talking about we're talking about the Roman festival that was called Saturnalia. Yep. I think that's the right that's uh, pronunciation of it. Maybe nobody knows the actual real pronunci- pronunciation, but but uh, celebrating the god Saturn, uh, and and uh, he was the agricultural god. He was the god of uh, time, uh, like changing seasons, things like that. Uh, and so basically the way that the Romans used uh, Saturnalia was basically just to be debauched yep. like stuff we're not going to talk about on a, C- on a on a on a podcast as Christian men um, the stuff that they did and that's 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 the uh, festival that corresponds to the time frame that we celebrate Christmas uh, and then there was the uh, the German one Yuletide uh, and it was kind of a kind of a similar deal. Uh, so who thinks about Saturnalia? It's like, are, are we confused? Like, oh, you have a Christmas tree in your house? You Saturnalian? I, I would guess that, I would guess that, uh, as soon as you said Saturnalia, I bet 50% of the people were like, is that like, are we celebrating Saturn? 
And, like, the, and the rest of the 50% are saying he's pronouncing it wrong. Correct. So he doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, and so he, so John Piper actually gives you an example here. So he says, I remember I lived next door to somebody back in seminary who didn't celebrate birthdays for their kid. Mm. The idea was partly that all days were special for their kid. So that's, huh. you know, it is what it is. But if all days are special, then it probably means that no days are special. So we've all heard that, right? Yep, yep. Um, yet some things are so good and precious, like anniversaries, birthdays, and even deaths, that they're worth they're worthy of being marked. You know, how much more the birth and death of Jesus Christ. Yep. Um, and he ends that with just saying, it's really worth the risk, even if the date of December 25th was chosen because of its proximity to some kind of pagan festival. So yeah, Saturnalia, right? Yuletide. Um, Let's just take it, sanctify it, and make the most of it because Christ is worthy of being celebrated in his birth. There's no point in choosing another date. It won't work. Right. Well, and so that would bring up whether or not, whether or not a, like, it's, it's such an odd, uh, like, if you're looking at scripture, and we're not going to get into all this, right? And people, if you're interested in this as a, as a, as a study in your Bibles, you can go ahead and take a look at, at where else in the Bible do they even talk about uh, this when when somebody was born. I mean, there's all kinds of stories about the circumstances of of when people were born, but it's not typically something that's celebrated. And so there is an argument out there that would say, well, we're not supposed to celebrate the birth of Christ because uh, because births are relatively insignificant because a birth happens before you've done anything insignificant or done anything significant, right? Well, and that's and honestly, with birthdays, I'm I'm actually confused why we actually celebrate someone's birthday and we don't actually sell like to me it would make more sense if we celebrated your mother because right. really, she's, really, the, one she's the, the one who did all the work <laughs> like, it's, it's really it's her birthday like yeah. yes, yes you were born that day but yeah it's, it's, it's kind of her day it's like here's a present because you're here yeah uh well and i think what john piper's hitting on you know we celebrate one another's birthdays because uh, in in because we value that or we value the person whose birthday we're celebrating and it's a way of showing that uh and and so okay so i don't know if anybody's heard that argument before uh that we should not celebrate the birth of christ because in the bible especially it's it's pretty inconsistent with scripture to emphasize uh this the the date of somebody's birth like that uh but at the same time so if, if you haven't heard that argument it's out there somewhere i don't know how how prevalent it is i've heard it i've had to i've had to defend christmas against that argument before uh wh- one of the things that i would just say about that is is we should celebrate christmas as christians because of the tremendous emphasis that was placed on the birth of christ uh at the t- at, in prophecy for one prior to his birth hundreds of years prior to his birth and on the day itself i mean if a heavenly host appears with an angel saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests, then then would it be wrong for us to continue the excitement over that event 2,000 years from it? As long as, as John Piper was putting it, uh, as long as we don't develop a new paganism and, and, the, and start making emphasis of the holiday itself. Correct. And so that's danger. No, and, and I think that's exactly right. I, I think... The idea of, I mean, because it does make sense to me that, um, I mean, again, the most significant, I mean, two of the most significant things that have ever happened in human history was the birth of Jesus and the death of Jesus. Death and resurrection combined, let's say. Yeah, there you go. So, I mean, so it's, that's enormous. So why wouldn't you want to mark that as, I mean, because as Christian, of course, the main purpose of this holiday, you know, just just to call it that, the holiday, is just that, is is exactly that. It's, it's his birth birth death resurrection and now because of that we're now saved you know we can now enter the kingdom this is it's such a significant thing and so it's it's always on christians minds and you know the thing is is that john piper doesn't really go into it but it's Mm -hmm. it's like well as long as you're keeping that at the forefront it's okay to decorate a tree it's okay to watch a christmas movie it's okay to i mean as as long as you're not putting those things before him you know, it's like, I mean, because I mean, what's, what's your order when it comes to Christmas, what's your order? Is it, I got to make sure I watch the Charlie Brown Christmas special. I got to make sure I wrap presents. Oh yeah. I, I better think about Jesus. You well, know? well and, and I think, you know, like, uh, this, this idea that, oh, we don't celebrate our kid's birthday because every day is special. Uh, for the Christian there, there is an element of that because, uh, we should be thinking about, we should be celebrating 
the birth, the life, the death and resurrection and ascension and reign of Jesus Christ all the time. I mean, you think about think about the song "Joy to the World." It says, uh, uh, "While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy." In the first verse of "Joy to the World," and heaven and nature sing. So there's a song out there going on uh, that's happening all the time and always has been, and it's and it's been about the person of Jesus Christ. You could even go back. You know, we have Christmas songs: "O Come, O Come, Emmanuel." Uh, songs will uh, come thou long expected Jesus that even uh, there there's even a celebration about the person of Jesus Christ prior to his birth from prophecy from uh, from the from the tremendous need that humankind has for him and we even have that song in O Holy Night long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and so so you really can't take uh, who Jesus is what Jesus did out of time and put it into a particular day like Christmas. I mean, we celebrate it all the time. And so then we have, we have this time of the year, uh, that we just pay special attention. Uh, not, we, we pay attention to it all year round as Christians, but we pay special attention to the particular event of his birth. Like, like at Easter, we pay particular attention to, his death and resurrection. Uh, but, but we do that as Christians, we do that all year. It's not like we're only thinking about the death and resurrection at Easter. And, and likewise, we're not only thinking about the birth of Jesus Christ at Christmas, but we have that, we have this Advent season between Thanksgiving and Christmas day or new year or whatever, where we pay special attention to his birth. And, And I think that's great because you can't identify the true meaning of Christmas without identifying our need for it. And, and what it, Christmas, the birth of Jesus is nothing without his death and resurrection. If he was just a baby that angels happen to show up and sing about, so what? It has to be about what this baby grew up, who, who he was in his incarnation, what he grew up and did, and what that means for us today. Otherwise, otherwise it's just a legend. Well, yeah, because it was just like, well, it says in uh, Luke 2... 73. There is no Luke 273. <laughs> there is. Luke, Luke has long. Let me check. <laughs> I bet there's not 70. Not in not in the second chapter. I bet there's not 73. Well, okay. If there, let's let's say there's not. Wait, is is there? I'm not? looking it up right now. See, this is where I feel like a moron if I'm like, there's not 73 chapters. Like, oh, there's 52. See, there's uh-huh. 52 verses. There's a lot. <sighs> so in Luke 273, there is no Luke 273. Um, Almost. It says, and the angels came to celebrate John Smith. You know, it's like <laughs> right. okay, well who cares like well, why didn't they come and celebrate if jesus was what the world and we're probably getting way off of what we're meaning here but but what do people think jesus birth was about what what is the whole world if they're willing to identify christmas with jesus at all what do they think his birth was about yeah yeah because that seems it seems like a silly qu- when you ask that it seems like a silly question well, here's my point because the bulk of the entire world that celebrates Christmas would identify Jesus as what? Oh, he was a good teacher. We've all heard this. He's a good teacher. Uh, he was a, a good moral leader. He's a good inspiration for every one of us. He set a good example. Uh, and that he came in. And here's this great line. It's actually uh, uh, the great company of heavenly hosts that you're talking about is Luke 2, 14, where the angels all say together, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among among those with whom he is pleased, according to the ESV Bible. Uh, and so this peace on earth idea, Jesus didn't succeed at that, if you're looking at it from a, a, a pragmatic standpoint. Like, all, all, for all intents and purposes, uh, that whole country that he lived in was destroyed by the Roman a- after a Jewish uprising against the Romans just a couple decades after he was born. So so much for that, right? Well, and I can I can feel I can feel I can feel it through the through the radio waves. Yeah. Um I can feel the radio? I don't Who's know. Paying for that. I have no idea. But I can I can hear there are people that are going right now like, well, first of all, Jesus wasn't born in December. Okay. Well let's talk about that for a second. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about that. So in Luke uh two, seven and eight, it says, And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, watching over them, or sorry, watching over their flock by night. So, this is debatable, and that's okay. we're, uh, so normally, according to, and this is according to Google, 
and a little bit of Bible research that I did. Sure. Um, according to um, most of the time, most of the time, not all the time, most of the time, shepherds at that time um, were not tending fields during December. Now, that, that doesn't mean they weren't ever. They said the majority of the time there wouldn't be shepherds um, with their flocks at that point. Okay. Um, Luke suggests um, that Jesus may have been born in summer or early fall, if that's the case. Um, cause, and, and, and also in December at that time, Judea um, would actually be cold and rainy hmm. during that time. So that also wouldn't have been like the best time to have your flock out and about. So... Uh, some theologians, some, some, not all, okay. um, have said that he also could have possibly been born in the spring because of that. Hmm. Um, so that's one example. Um, two, at the time, of course, Mary's pregnant. Yep. Um, the, you know, give or take maybe a mile or two, the, the trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem is roughly like 70 miles. So okay. that would have been a pretty, like just on foot, yeah. that would have been a pretty big, and if it's the middle of winter, so that's a that's a pretty good hike. Yes. Um, so I have to imagine that would have been a pretty nasty, because where, where we're from Even people, on a donkey. <laughs> even on a donkey. So like where we're from, it's not abnormal to be like, oh, there's no snow. Oh, there's seven feet of snow. You yeah. Know? So that would be, that would be pretty, pretty hard for a woman who's nine months pregnant. So, um... You know, again, it's also been suggested that Jesus was born in September, um, mostly because if you start at the conception of John the Baptist. So if you if you count when um, John the Baptist was was conceived, um, which was in June, hmm. you go forward six months to when Gabriel announced the conception of Jesus. Um, that would basically put it in December. Then you count forward nine months from there, and okay. you get September. Okay, so so, wait, th- so we're the dates that you're proposing September. September-ish? So, like, yeah, September-ish. Because that would be... Because, um, yeah, if you read... You know, uh, and I don't... I apologize. I didn't write down the this, this scripture. Okay. Um, but when, when it says when John the Baptist was conceived, it was in June, roughly. Um, and then, like I said, you go forward six months from there, which is when Gabriel announced Jesus' conception. Okay. So that would put it right in December at that time. So then you go nine, fr- nine months from that time from puts Jesus' conception, September. which puts it in September. Okay. This is interesting. And then the only, uh, as far as I could tell, and I did a lot of research on this. Okay. Um, the only other thing that, in the, well, I shouldn't say the only other thing. One of the only th- other things I found um, in Luke 2, uh, 1 through 3, it says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Yes. Um, and this was the first census that took place while, um, and I pr- I'm going to butcher this, um, Quirinius? Does that sound right? Where's she at? Uh-uh. Um, but he was the governor of Syria at the time. And everyone went to their own town to register. Yep. Um, and because of the weather, a census at that time would not have been taken during the winter months. Okay. So, and that's that's all I got on that. Okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add a couple things to this. I happen to be uh, somewhat, and, and I'm a somewhat of a stargazer. And, and those of you out there who are listening who might actually be real stargazers would probably not find me to be so. But if I'm just talking to an average person uh, on the street or at church or something like that, I'm a... Uh, They'd walk right going, that guy's a stargazer. Yeah, that's right. Because I, I like to watch the planets and their courses and things like that. Okay, so here in 2016, uh, we had a planetary conjunction. And... Uh, and Maybe even a lot of you guys don't realize that some of the brightest stars that you're seeing out there when you look into the night sky are actually planets. And there's, there's, I'm not going to go into it, but there's five planets that are visible at any, on any given night. Sometimes you see them, sometimes they're on the opposite side of our planet, like in China, or no, sorry. You uh, see China? Well, no, no, no. <laughs> no, then like the southern hem- hemisphere. Sorry, China's not in the southern hemisphere. But the southern hemisphere might see some at night where the northern hem- All that stuff. Uh, we might be in the wrong position going around the sun to see us- them at night. They're in the daytime sky, not the nighttime. All this stuff. But anyway, if you can see them at night, various times of the year, there's five that you can see with the naked eye. And, uh, and, and so in 2016, in August we had a planetary conjunction between Jupiter and Venus. Those are the two brightest uh, objects in the sky next to the moon uh, when they show up in our night sky. So you got 
two really bright stars, Jupiter, when well, they're planets, Jupiter and Venus, and they came within a couple degrees of each other in August of 2016. And uh, uh, there's there's some people that kind of rewound the the planetary model and were proposing that that this actually could have been the star of Bethlehem. So right? the, so the star of Bethlehem could have been Venus and or Jupiter or both? Uh, it would, like, when you see, if you were to see two planets come together, and, and, and we got to keep in mind that the Bible, um, when the Bible says they saw a star, uh, it's not maybe not telling us everything that the wise men were thinking when they saw the star, right? Uh, the Bible's just telling us, based on contemporary language at the time, what they would have called it, and it's not giving us the scientific explanation. Well, they saw a planet appear, and they followed the course of the planet over the course of the entire year, and realized that these two... The, the theory is that, that the wise men were watching, and they, they, they knew, because they were, they were charting this stuff, and they were wise men, not stupid men. Uh, they would have had the wherewithal, the knowledge, and all that stuff to see that, wait a second, this... This planet's going to conjoin with that planet on this date, and that means, and somehow they were able to ascertain that means that the long expected king of the Jews is going to be born. The crazy thing about that is they were right. Whatever it is that the star was supposedly telling them, they were right about. So, really, they were stargazers. They were real stargazers. See, and that's I'm, funny because I, it's funny. I, I didn't want to interrupt because you were, you, you were on, you were running. <laughs> and. It's funny because as soon as you said they weren't stupid men, I was like, how <laughs> different would that be in the Bible? Is if <laughs> well, the Bible does talk about stupid men. It calls them worthless fellows, and they they didn't call these guys worthless fellows. See, they call them star. Or that, they star, call them wise men. And that, and that's funny because it always when they when they say stuff like that in the Bible, like, they don't just come out and be like those stupid men. No. Like they look, it just sounds so. It almost, it almost sounds like they were written by European yeah. people because they're like, well, these these rather cheeky fellows, they <laughs> they weren't following her, right, you know. These men with high hopes followed a star. No, they were wise men. They ascertained from the, whatever this was that they watched. Okay, so the theory is that they had identified a future planetary conjunction. Uh, when a plant, when two planets converge, if they actually converge in the same spot in our sky, it would appear as insanely bright. But even if they didn't, they're just kind of close together. It is an occurrence worth taking a look at. I watched the planet because this is what I do on a very amateur level. Not Nerd. like the wise men. I'm the stupid man. Um, but the wise men were watching it on a like a super professional level. But it, it is something to see. I watched the one in 2016 with a, with a view that it's possible that this was the star of Bethlehem. And I watched it happen in the sky. They're close together. They didn't show up as one star. It wouldn't be mistaken as one star. But it was something to take a look at. Now, here's my point. Uh, they can rewind the computer model to see when it last occurred. When's the last time? See, that's exactly what I was going to ask yeah, you. Yeah. The last time that Jupiter and Venus came together in the sky was uh, around August of 3 BC. Okay. <sighs> Yeah, <laughs> the timing works out. It actually checks out that here Ben with his theory. Now, uh, he was saying Jesus would have been born in September-ish. Uh, what if he was a little premature? So like like late August. Late August. Had been like uh, I think the date that they're giving us is August 12. Uh, the time that it happened in 2016 was August 27. So in that time, we're, we're in the time frame where you could expect if the baby was... Now, would they travel all the way to Bethlehem if she was nine months you know if she if they might not have made the trip I'm, I'm just thinking from a practical standpoint that when we men are our wives are expecting babies we we take particular precautions that what if the baby comes when uh but it says that while they were there the time came for the baby to be born we all know what that means yeah and 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 it's very possible that this was an unexpected she went into labor and she thought she had another couple months you know, a couple weeks to go or something i don't know i'm just speculating that that if the September date that Ben's proposing checks out, then Jesus might have come a little bit premature on the date that lines up with the historic. I mean, we know for a fact the last time Jupiter and Venus came together in the sky was 3 BC in late August, mid to late August. That all checks out. Jesus could have been a premature baby. Mathematically, that would check out. Um that's just I'm just throwing it out there because Ben threw it out there. Yeah, we're not we're not. No, we're, we're not, not saying anything. Nope. He, we, again, not a professional stargazer. I'm just we're talking over coffee. Again, that's again that's coffee again. Yes. Um, 
And that, by the way, that is a per, that is a an impressive carafe of coffee you have there. And not to mention that, but I am using a left of center podcast mug. It's true. We're gonna have to. We might have to do mugs later on prior to the last uh, conjunction of Venus and Jupiter. It's true. It's all true. Well, but see, this is interesting because and, and by the way, yeah, we should preface this with. If you're listening and you do not celebrate Christmas, or you do not celebrate—I mean, you, you celebrate the Jesus, but you don't celebrate the brew, haha, if mm. you will—we're not telling you that you should. That's that's not what we're saying here. Um, we're kind of just talking about Christmas because it's Christmas. It's Christmas. Like we're not telling. Like like look, if you don't, you know, like uh, we do Elf on the Shelf. We love it. Okay. Uh, my kids will not be listening to this, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, but my 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 children love Elf on the Shelf. Like they've got their you know. They've got a little elf named Chester. Mm-hmm. Chester gets into some antics in the house. Yep. Um, and also, Chester is very good for um, redirecting behavior. Mm. So, if the children are not behaving, and we're like, well, hmm, okay, what's Chester going to write them a letter about? And my wife will use her little elfin handwriting and mm-hmm. write like, hey, Quit goofing around or you're not getting your presents. Because the elf on the shelf is watching. The elf on the shelf is you watching. You mean it's kind of like threatening your kids that when the UPS man comes and delivers a package, you could also send your child with the UPS man? <laughs> well, here's... I know, send that. him to Abu Dhabi, like Garfield <laughs> like, style. Garfield. Well, here's the thing. So, and this is very interesting. So, I just... And, we're, by the way, there are no... Uh, we don't we don't bother with any kind of you know smooth we're gonna go into different stuff you guys just have to get used to that like we're, we're just, just gonna talking. jump around we're just talking but i found this interesting a wife a wife of my friends a friend of my wife's there we go uh-huh. um they actually do this and I, this is this is almost cruel in my mind but it's very funny and it does work so they will actually wrap empty boxes hmm. um and put them next to the presents okay and if their children are not behaving, they will take one of those boxes. They will go out back to their burn bin and throw it in there and set it on fire. Nice. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> so when I heard that, I was like, that's that's crazy. It's basically, every parent, for better or worse, has their method. Indeed. And an elf on the shelf is a potentially a behavior it's a, modification method. It is. It's, it's not like, you know, it's not like. You know, we could do, I mean, we could do it another way. You know, we could do it like dogs, you know, we're like spray them with like, Ch-ch-ch. hey, don't do that. You know, spray <laughs> yeah. water in the face. We don't do that. But mm. I don't know. I, I think, you know, again, again, and we can't say this enough. Like, we're just talking. We're just having a conversation. We're not telling you, like, it's literally a question of should Christians celebrate Christmas? We're just putting that no, out there. Well, and, and look, we're, you know, we talk about the date, December, August. Uh, there's even one in here, Ben, on this. Uh, this I'm, I'm looking at space.com, by the way. This is where I'm getting... Uh, the information on the last uh, conjunction of those planets and everything. Uh, so one happened in in August, and one happened the following June in two BC. So these are these are these are potential dates. If you're if you think if you could think if you can even imagine that that the 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 star that the wise men were so joyful to see, as the Book of Matthew tells us, was actually a planetary conjunction. A lot of things make sense about that because they would have been watching it for the whole year traveling along with it you know marking it and all that stuff all 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 of this is basically just verifying uh for us as christians that the birth of jesus actually happened just like the bible says it did Uh, so celebrate the festivities of christmas or not we do identify in theology we identify in history we identify for the benefits of our hearts and minds as christians that he was actually born as a human that god came and was actually born as a human like the book of john tells us and see that makes uh, that it actually makes more sense to me now because like it, it would make sense to me that you know if it is in fact a planetary conjunction which by the way every time you say conjunction every time yeah. I keep thinking conjunction junction in my head <laughs> schoolhouse rock but no it, it, it makes it pop it, culture I I would never have thought of <laughs> that again in my life well it's, it's horrible too because you were doing that and then every time you said <laughs> Venus I was like I'm your Venus oh, yeah. I'm like okay but but it, it is crazy. Um, and, and, and for anybody who didn't know, like maybe, maybe you didn't know this, Rob. Mm. So even something as simple as mistletoe, like we all know mm. mistletoe, you know, little, little yeah. weed you hang up and you're like, Oh, yeah. you're standing underneath it. I better kiss you. Um, you know, that was actually, um, that goes all the way back to like druids and oh, like, sure. cause like, you know, that's, you know, they would use that for like. 
Well, it didn't really have anything to do with that. I mean, you know, they would use that kind of stuff in Christmas lights. And actually back then, of course, it was probably less Christmas lights because they didn't have electricity. And it was probably more about um, candles. You know, okay. they'd light lots of candles. and Because keep... to them, that was, um, of course, to celebrate winter solstice. Mm. Um I'm trying to think of what else. Um, I mean, it, and it was part of the Saturnalia. Yeah, you know, it was because. Yep, yep. And actually, everybody doesn't know Saturnalia. It was during that time. It was the first time where they had like um, they brought in gift giving. They would have giant feasts, um, and they would actually do candle burning, kind of to um, a to celebrate the winter sol- solstice and b to ward away quote unquote evil spirits and stuff. Yeah. So it's kind of it's because when you think about it. And I don't, it's it's weird to even think of Christmas as a pagan holiday because it's so positive. I mean, if you if you take Christ out of Christmas, which yeah. you can't because Christ makes up the majority of the word Christmas. Yeah, right, right, right. Um, but like, think about it: bright lights, giving, mm-hmm. um, spending time with your family. Like all these are it's 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 an entire. It's it's not. It's weird because usually when you think pagan, mm-hmm. you think negative. Yep. You know, you think you know people. You know, you get into Halloween or witchcraft or you know whatever death you, and death. human sacrifices. Exactly. And so like blood. you know, it's like it's not like hey, let's celebrate Christmas. Oh really? Did you get a human to sacrifice this mm-hmm. year? Yeah, we got three. You know, no, it's not yeah. about that. It's I mean, literally, it's a season of giving. It's yep. a season of uh, you know. It almost seems like at this time of year, people love each other more. They accept each other more. There's more grace. You know, oddly, there's more. Gra- there shouldn't be more grace than any time of the year, but there seems to be more this time of the year. Believe it or not, I, <laughs> uh, we're, we're recording this on a Saturday, and uh, and so I've prepared my sermon for tomorrow at the church that I preach at in another small town nearby, uh, and I'm actually saying that exact thing. Booyah! Yeah, I called ben, it. <laughs> Ben's on the. He's he's a uh, theology. In the theology podcast, oh boy! Yes, yeah. if, if I was the if, uh, if I was the theologian of the podcast, this would last. Hey, no, this you're, episode you're getting there. I'm getting there. I love it, but this is this is fun. This is what we're talking about, though. Like whether or not you do celebrate Christmas or you don't celebrate Christmas. If you don't have a Christmas tree, if you do, you well, know, what? let's That's, talk about some of those things. And because let's do it. Uh, okay, so uh, let's let's uh, for anybody because I we know people. I'm sure you know people. I know people who. Who do wrestle, people. just like John Piper uh, was talking about. People wrestle with, uh, are we supposed to celebrate Chris- Christmas as Christians? We want to be faithful Christians. We want to not be worldly. We don't want to uh, uh, give into the pattern of this world, which is uh, a verse out of uh, Romans chapter 12. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. And so maybe to celebrate Christmas with all these festivities is a... Uh, objectively of the world and and so uh if anybody's concerned about that maybe we can be of some encouragement today uh and and actually give something now if the if like if december 25th was originally a a pagan thing should we should we be wary of that well like john piper said nobody thinks about the pagan aspect at least not saturnalia at least not yuletide nobody's thinking about those rites, rituals, or whatever, the symbology of Saturn. Nobody's thinking about that. So so whatever the pagan roots are has no bearing on today's celebration of Christmas. Not at all. However, what we do have to be uh, wary of is, like John Piper said, the modern paganism. And I would, I would, I would be wary of that as well. And here's why. Because the modern paganism would make Christmas about anything other than Jesus. Yep. Or, or at best, make Jesus a part of what Christmas is all about, but not all of what Christmas is all about. So is there a way uh, to take all the things that our culture normally does? Uh, and, and it's and it's okay to be weird and say, well, we're not going to celebrate Christmas at all. So that, that's okay, too. And, and I would say if, if that's going to be you and your family, have your reasons all spelled out. Here's the reason we're going to stand apart from the world this year and not do what the world does at Christmas because the world is doing a lot wrong with Christmas. But what are, if you decide, well, our family really loves uh, this time of the year and we do come together, as Ben said, there's, there's more uh, loving expression. There is a positivity. There is a brightness to it. Uh, well, what are some of those things that could be uh, sanctified into a you know, that, that we could look at from a, a Christian perspective. Uh, 
is if it's important to do that i think there's precedent that it's important to do that because once upon a time christians who came out of paganism christians who came out of rome out of roman uh culture would have been perhaps been celebrating the birth of christ instead of saturnalia well we're not going to celebrate uh saturn and and all the agri you know him as the agricultural god of time and all this stuff uh we're going to celebrate at this time of year we're, we're going to celebrate the birth of jesus christ or yuletide however when 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 the germans were being converted to christianity they maybe thought well we have all these things that we love why don't we just make it about jesus and that's what we have to do with all our life everything that we love if you love music now your love of music will have something to do with jesus uh in in, in first corinthians we say uh, whether you eat, drink, or anything that you do, do all to the glory of God. Well, one time when your hearts were hard towards Christ, you weren't doing anything to the glory of God. Now you're, you're even supposed to eat and drink to the glory of God. So can you take what would be a modern paganism, tree, Christmas trees, Christmas lights, gift giving, Santa Claus, and actually identify what's, uh, what's sanctified about it? And I, I think the answer can be yes. Uh, but you'd have to be very deliberate about it. I don't know what you think about all that. Well, and, 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 and my thing is, where, where where do you draw the line? So you know, like, let's move it from Christmas and say, okay, well, we don't we don't have a Christmas tree. We don't do lights. We don't do presents. We don't do Santa because that's paganism. Hmm. Well, but then you if you break it down to everything else. Now, again, I'm not telling anyone how if they should or should not. You know, because there are plenty of people that don't, they don't even bother with Santa Claus. They're like, no, he doesn't, he's not real. Like, why, why even do it? And for Au my, contraire. Well, that, yeah. And we, we, we can get into that if we want to. Um, we will. I think it'd be fine. So for, for myself and my wife, my wife is super, Rob knows my wife very well. Yep. So like she is the walking embodiment of the spirit of Christmas. Like mm. that's just, that is her deal. That's her thing. She loves it. And I love Christmas too. But, you know, we, you know, for her, because she grew up, you know, believing in Santa Claus and, you know, for her, she gets so much joy, um, out of, you know, the kids believing in Santa or the elf on the shelf or, and it has nothing to do again. Like, you know, in our household, we don't go, well, we have our tree up because yeah. it is, it is time to celebrate Saturnalia. That has <laughs> right. nothing to do like for us. Like, like, honestly, I didn't even know the word Saturnalia until like seven days ago, six, yeah, sure. seven days ago. Sure. So, you know, again, I think I think it's easy to separate because I mean, obviously, we have a Christian household, you know, and we and and our children know, you know, and actually, you know, we we go to the same church, Rob and I, yep. and you know, our kids were in the Christmas program. Mm -hmm. They understand. They know that Christmas is about Jesus. They know it's yep. about you know. So, again, that's that's one hundred percent in the forefront, and so just the secondary things of, and again, we're talking about. We don't do, you know, we don't, uh, we don't celebrate Santa, nope. but we just allow Santa to be a part of our lives because of the joy, because of, you know, the happiness that it brings our children and my wife. And my, and my point of bringing them up is that it, it presents an opportunity, doesn't it? Uh, Santa does to talk about, I mean, and I don't know if you've ever done this with, with your family. Uh, I've done it with mine, uh, but to just actually say, okay, Let's, uh, here, here's this red man, this red man in the red velvet suit who the legend is this, but, but who was he? It, you know, is he real? Well, the one you see in the mall, he's not real, but, but was he real? And the answer is yes. And so yes, he was. It, it does provide an opportunity to talk about St. Nicholas. Uh, the legend of, uh, Santa being connected to gifts was just something that St. Nicholas himself would do. And it's actually a really small part of his legend. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know if you know anything about the legend of St. Nicholas or not the legend, but the, but the actual historic theological significance of St. Nicholas. And so let's, let's talk about if you're a family who, who does like Ben, uh, takes in all of Christmas elf on the shelf, the Christmas lights, the Christmas tree and all these things, Christmas programs at the church, uh, and, and, uh, and you're wondering, is there, uh, and I don't even want to say, is there redeemable quality to it? It's not that it's, can we go back to the original instead of the moniker, instead of the caricature of Santa and say, well, well who was this man? And I got a funny story to tell with this, uh, this year was, and it, we've done this with our kids too, is see how long we can pull off the Santa's coming legend mm -hmm. and, uh, and, how long our kids can can believe it uh our our son dalton who's who's 
turning 16 next month, uh, back when he was, I don't know, eight, uh, we kept it up for quite a while and he was starting to tell us, um, mom and dad, I, I know that you, you guys are Santa. I know that Santa's not real. And, uh, later on that day or week or something was really close to the time that he thought he had that figured out. We happened to be somewhere where, uh, somebody came in to the, uh, festivities as Santa, but this man had the real beard. He had a real white beard. He really was jolly and fat, exactly like you'd imagine him. And he was dressed as Santa and he was bringing presents to the thing that we were at. And I, and I said, okay, Dalton, if Santa's not real, then who's that? And, you know, his eyes get big as saucers and he would deny being fooled today. He was all oh, that didn't fool me. But I remember that day and I think he, he was fooled at least for a couple more minutes. And so that's all in good fun, right? But uh, but who is Santa? So here's my other story. My daughter, uh, Isabella, is eight years old this year. And uh, and it I felt it was kind of time to reveal that the, the legend that our culture associates with Santa isn't really true. Because she's old enough and, and she can think enough to, uh, to actually understand, perhaps, and appreciate the real St. Nicholas and what really happened. So here's what happened. Uh, back in the 4th century... Uh, there was something that arose in the church called the Arian controversy. This man named Arius denied that Jesus Christ was was one with God. He believed he was the son of God. He believed he was a divine son of God, was sent by God into this world to be our savior, but he was not himself God, okay? And and we see that Arianism, we call it, associating with Jehovah's Witness, with the Latter-day Saints, they're there is modern day Arianism. It just goes back to the fourth century, back to Arius is what we would call it as Christians. We would call it a heresy back to Arius's heresy. So, uh, the legend is, uh, that Arius is in this council and he's declaring what he believes about Jesus, that Jesus isn't really God, that he's merely a divine being, uh, He's the son of God or even created by God. Well, while Arius is doing this and making this speech or making this case, St. Nicholas walks up to him and punches him in the face. Now, supposedly, this is a true story, and I believe it 100%. So uh, the, this, this is the story of St. Nicholas punched Arius in the face when Arius was denying that Jesus and God were one. And so, to me, this is a fantastic story. I love this story about St. Nicholas. And so when I think of Santa Claus, I think of St. Nicholas punching Arius in the face. And so it was time this year to say, all right, uh, Isabella, here's what you see as Santa Claus, this red man in, or this man in the red velvet suit, but here's, here's what the real St. Nicholas did. And so I kind of coughed it up that no, there isn't a Santa Claus coming to bring presents. You're right. It is me and mom. Cause that's, that was her question. Is it, is it really you and mom? Yes. Let me tell you about the real Santa. And so we were in the mall and, and she sees, she sees the, the caricature over there getting his picture taken with screaming kids. And, uh, and she turns to me and she says, what was the name of that man that Santa whacked? <laughs> As a, Dad, t- tell, tell me about this man that, uh, that, <laughs> Santa, uh, that Santa whacked him. And so, uh, to me, the, uh, I look at that as a Christmas win. <laughs> to, to associate our modern character of Santa Claus with actual historic heroism, heroism of St. Nicholas himself. And now my daughter, from this time on, Lord willing, will never disassociate those two. She sees Santa. She hears about Santa. She's thinking about a man who, uh, he went to an extreme uh, to stand up for Jesus Christ, to stand up for what the Bible says about Jesus Christ. And that's the legend of Santa to me. In my family, we know Santa, we know Santa Claus as the man who defended uh, what the Bible says about Jesus. See, and that's funny because, do you hear that, boys and girls? If you don't believe that Jesus is actually God, you're going to get punched in the face. (laughs) Santa's going to whack you. Santa's going to whack you, apparently. (laughs) No, see, and that's, and that's, and again, that's, and that's what we're talking about here. We're not, you know, again, you know, whether or not you, and, and, and like Rob's saying too, it's, it it is something that we do for our children simply because again, it's, it's fun. You know, it's, it's fun for the parents. Like it's fun when, like I said, when our elf on the shelf, Chester, like, Hmm. you know, if my son won't clean his room. 
uh, all of a sudden Chester is hanging from his ceiling and all his toys are gone because he didn't clean his room. You know, it's mm-hmm. like it's it's funny for us. It, it's also again, it's um, it's pointing him in the right direction as far as behavior behavior. Um, and it's, it's a good, it is a good thing. Now, however, if we were like, okay, and my son's name is Riley. And if I said, mm-hmm. Riley, look, your presents are gone because, um, well, you know, Santa took them and Santa's real and Jesus is not, or, oh, yeah. you know, it's like, I mean, if we, if we said something that ridiculous, I mean, that's, you know, that's the extreme of course. But again, you know, and we know, we both know people who don't celebrate Christmas. They yeah, don't. Sure do. Um, and that's fine. And, and as we're talking about, again, we're, we're just having a conversation here. We're just pointing out, um, you know, we're, we're giving you biblical information. We're giving you outside information. We're making you stargazers. Stargazers, um, nice. You know, we're that's what we're doing here. We're just we're just having a conversation. So at the end of the day, if you're a Christian, um, that it's it's up to you. You know, whether or not you want. If you have a Christmas tree, great. If you don't again and and i think it's important too as christians i think we need to not only focus on what we need to focus on but we also need to focus on those of us who may differ on the opinion of i mean if you're someone who does have a christmas tree you do santa claus elf on the shelf whatever if you know somebody who doesn't like it's fine like you know right well and 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 the the sad thing is, is that we end up uh, as Christians, we end up challenge. Over, I would say even over challenging. Yeah, yeah, because the one who says, "Hey, I'm convic- I'm convicted in my heart that Christians should not celebrate Christmas," and you know, like I said before, I, I think that have your reasons well defined and know from Scripture where you stand, and your own reasons help articulate to your kids why we as a family are standing apart from the culture in order to not celebrate Christmas. That it, it is it is so important to stand apart from the from the culture and the message of the culture and to stand for Jesus and in your own way, do what St. Nicholas did in the first place and punch Arius in the face that we all as Christians have to do that. There is a way to do that. Um, the, the, on one side, the danger is that you only do that by throwing out things like Christmas and you're not doing that in every aspect of your life. Remember that we also have to love the people in the world in order to, to display to them the love of Jesus Christ. Uh, and so if you've got a way of doing that, uh, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, for those of you who might find yourself challenged in, in really good ways. And if, if a family, if somebody, you know, challenges your celebration of Christmas and leaves you thinking, oh crud, maybe I shouldn't be celebrating Christmas. Uh, and, and, and you're, you know, if you're challenged in that way, that, that might be fine. And we, I want to be in here today, want to be an encouragement to you, uh, that, that there's, uh, that there, there, there is the, there are these precedents like with St. Nicholas punching Arius in the face. And there, there's one about a Christmas tree and I'll, I'll share a bit if, uh, if maybe as we close, I'll, I'll give us a, a scripture that you as your family, uh, can, can, uh, rally around that, you know, as we think about our Christmas tree, as we're putting up our Christmas tree, as we're decorating our Christmas tree or opening presents around a Christmas tree, here's a biblical way to think about the Christmas tree, even though it might have pagan roots. Nobody's thinking about the pagan roots today. So how do we think about this? Why are we doing this with a Christmas tree? Uh, there's a reason, and the Bible might help us. Uh, Ezekiel 17, <laughs> it would take us a whole nother podcast to actually unpack uh, what what this all can, what this all is intending to mean and what it can mean. Uh, so let me just use this as a, perhaps a springboard for you and your family as to uh, think about it study it, get into the scripture, uh, think about all that you already know from the scripture and start to put the pieces together, start to connect the dots, right? Ezekiel 17, uh, one through eight, I'll just read it. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, propound a riddle and speak a parable to the house of Israel. Say, thus says the Lord God, a great eagle with great wings and long pinions, rich in plumage of many colors came to Lebanon and took the, and took the top of the cedar. We, of course, know the cedar is a tree. (laughs) He broke off the topmost of its young twigs and carried it to a land of trade and set it in a city of merchants. Then he took the seed of the land and planted it in fertile soil. He placed it beside abundant waters. He set it like a willow twig and it sprouted and became a low spreading vine and its branches turned towards him and its roots remained where it stood. So it became a vine 
and produce branches and put out boughs. And so there's a lot there's a lot of symbolic language in there, but you can you can maybe gather that there's a lot of symbolic language in there that you find throughout the rest of the Bible. And uh, in long story short, I can say it's all talking about the same thing. All of Scripture points to Jesus Christ. Uh, so much of Old Testament prophecy is not only pointing to the reality of Jesus Christ, the reality of God as Savior coming to save us in the form of a of a of a Redeemer, of a Messiah, of a Deliverer. But uh, we have a, we have all this language talking about the reality of Jesus Christ, and 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 we can see it. The similarity here in this stretch, Ezekiel 17, 1 through 8, uh, just like we see it everywhere else in the Bible, all of scripture pointing to Jesus Christ and, and this being no different. What is the top of the cedar tree? Why is it being plucked off of one tree and being put somewhere else? Why is it taking root there and not just staying on the top of the tree? There's all kinds of biblical, uh, biblical reality. There's all kinds of spiritual reality uh, going back into Israel, God working through all of the all the world through the gentiles not only the jews and things like that it's all there it's all there here so as you put to as you uh celebrate christmas around your christmas tree as you have something to do with your christmas tree decorating your christmas tree taking down your christmas tree opening presents around your christmas tree maybe you want to explore in your mind what, what does all this mean how does this all point to christ and and now your christmas tree might be in your home uh just a visual representation of the tree from ezekiel 17. Just an idea. Just an idea. Just throwing it out there. Just throwing it out there. Talk you know, about Ezekiel 17 in your home. Well, you know, and, and again, I think this is, as Christians, you know, it's something to just take a look at to try to, you know, because again, if, if you can, and justify is not the right word. No. Um, but just be able to find, you know, again, yeah. if, you're, if you're able to find those similarities um, between just the normal holiday stuff and what's actually biblical, you know, it, again, I don't think you have to justify it to anybody, but, but just having that, you know, being able to say, well, you know, we yes, we do have a Christmas tree, but if you look in Ezekiel, you know, this is kind of, you know, you, you could, you could essentially say, I don't have a better way. I don't, I don't, can't think of a better way to help my children understand or even help my own mind and heart understand what Ezekiel 17 could mean than to, than to take the reality of Christmas and what we as Christians believe about Christmas and and this tree that Ezekiel 17 is talking about and who Christ is in that sim, in that symbolic parable you know propound a riddle speak a parable there's a tree that gets snapped off here and puts here well what do you do with a christmas tree you cut it off there and you put it here <laughs> we want the tree uh, the the tree that is Christ perhaps so to speak is what this is actually saying we want it to grow in our home could you say that? Could you say that this is what the Christmas tree means to our family? Uh, the Christmas song, uh, Be Born in Us Today, is, is one of the lions. Uh, another one, uh, Fit Us for Heaven. We think of all these different things that we're asking Christmas to do for us. Uh, Till he appeared and the soul felt its worth, the worth of its appearing, another Christmas song. And so can we do that with the Christmas tree? And say, we're looking at it not from the pagan standpoint, because nobody knows the pagan origins of the Christmas tree. But for you and your family, can you say, we like this idea that Jesus Christ, who was born of the Jewish people, is is broken off the top. He's planted here in our home. I don't know if that's exactly the theological. That's not a slam dunk necessarily, but but it's it might be a helpful image. It's, it's a pretty good layup, though. All right. I would say so. <laughs> so basically, I mean, everybody, Merry Christmas. Thank you guys so much for listening. Um... Really, when you break it down, what we're really talking about today is that if you celebrate Christmas, St. Nick will punch you in the face. <laughs> You've been listening to the Theolo Theologic Geeks podcast. My name is Ben Knight. I'm Rob Royce. Merry Christmas, you guys.